The title of this message is The Conundrum or Contradiction. Like in science, when you find things that don't fit the way the theoretical construct is supposed to go, they investigate deeper. And usually, over time, they find deeper truths, newer truths, or they correct what they thought they knew, they correct what was wrong and what they thought they knew. It knows you go to deeper truth, great deeper knowledge. Same thing is true in the Bible. There's a conundrum in the Bible where Paul seems to say, or at least the way people interpret what he's saying, that the law is done away, and yet there are many other scriptures, actually more, where he seems to say the law is wonderful, I support it. So what's the conundrum? And um, we're going to unravel it. And by the way, when you read Paul's letter, remember, we're reading somebody else's mail. I'll, I'm going to put it in my words. He was writing to the Galatians. Well, the Galatians knew certain things about Paul because Paul founded several churches in Galatia. It's a province of the Roman Empire. Several churches, and they spent quite a bit of time with Paul, uh, at least six, seven months, probably each congregation, and maybe more. And they saw him preach every Sabbath. They saw him read from the, the scrolls, the only Bible at the time in the Old Testament. And they saw the kind of things he stood for. So a lot of the misunderstandings that we might get today, the Galatians wouldn't have gotten because they knew Paul. If that make, so when Paul writes to them, he doesn't have to give them a whole lot of qualifiers and backgrounds. Like, do you support the Bible completely? They knew he did. So in other words, it wouldn't, but coming from the modern background, it might be an issue. I just want to say that. <clears throat> and that's sometimes you have to remember who he's writing to, and they know something about Paul that we don't. Well, here's the scripture, the main one that people uh, use to say, that, did Paul say the law was meaningless and useless? Galatians 2.16. And there are two or three like this, and then there are many, many that say the opposite. This is the conundrum or the possible contradiction. Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified, emphasize that word, justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no man shall be justified. Now, from our world, when you read that, coming from the background that people have today, that you know, kind of throws people off sometimes. But I want to just read a few of the scriptures on the other side. There are many, but I just want to read a few. Romans 3.31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Because a lot of people say that. Well, Paul actually, just so he's not misunderstood, he poses the question, then he answers it. Certainly not. Or are you crazy? Or no way. I mean, I'm putting in my words. Or the King James, I'm using the new King James. King James is a little bit different. But... Uh, certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Actually, faith and grace establish the law, which most of you probably know, because you can't repent of something that's not illegal. In other words, you can't be speeding if there's no law with a speed limit. Acts 24.14. But this I confess to you, Acts 24.14. I worship the God of my fathers, believing all, I emphasize the word A-L-L, -L, all things written in the law and the prophets. So Paul believes everything in the Old Testament. He even, in 1 Corinthians 9, to a church problem, he applies a, I call a minor law about muzzling an ox. And he shows you there's a modern, well, modern for his day, and, but it would apply to ours too, interpretation of that. Actually, when I worked at the cafeteria at Big Sandy, they applied that principle to me because they said, well, can I eat in the cafeteria free since I work there? And they, they looked at the law and said, yeah, if you work there, you can eat free. I know I shouldn't have been so concerned about food, you're all thinking, but I was young and carnal then. Now I'm old and carnal. <laughs> oh, uh, older and carnal. Paul is not going in two different directions. So, um, and of course, the only Bible of his day was the Old Testament. So they understood Paul, but it's a problem for people today. Here's the real problem that Paul was opposing in, 
in Galatians. Actually, in most of the Old New Testament epistles, Paul is opposing the Judaizing party. And you got to understand the Judaizing party, or you will misunderstand a good chunk of the New Testament. You really will. And I'll try to explain it as best I understand it. I think you almost have to have been in their world to fully understand it, because the world is different now. Um, the, Jew, the Jewish people, now, by the way, there, there are variations in Jewish sex, even in those days there were, and all the Jewish people weren't that religious. But the majority of the religious people and the religious leaders over-regulated Judaism. They took God's law and they built rules around it. Sort of like in our government, you know, the, the bureaucrats build regulations based on laws Congress passes. Sometimes they get carried away. But they over-regulated the Jewish people um, so that it became a burden. Christ complained about it, the burden. Uh, but I want to go to the very next verse after 16, Galatians 2.17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore the minister of sin? And those are his answer, certainly not. Are you crazy? Are you kidding? No. So the very next verse makes, Paul makes it clear he's not using justification based on faith as an excuse to be a sinner. And I use the mud puddle example. We used it before, but if you're standing in the middle of a cesspool, a little boy, and your mom's got a water hose to clean you off, and she sprays you down, but you say, no, I'm walking back in the cesspool. I'm staying in the cesspool. Why bother to wash him off? He's going to stay in the cesspool. So why would God justify you if there's no level of repentance to try to get out of the cesspool of sin? Or Natalie gave me the poison ivy example. If the kid's got poison ivy and you have calamine lotion and you're putting it on him to stop the issues and problems, but he immediately goes back into the poison ivy bushes, and he, he's going to stay there. Why bother to treat him? It's like it probably would get worse, actually. The calamine lotion would eventually have no effect. So you understand the problem. Um, <clears throat> And um, this is Romans 6, 3. Let me get the right verse. Or do you not know that many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. When you hear that in the Bible, newness of life, newness, 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 really what he means is the old you went down the watery grave of baptism. The new you comes out and tries to live a new life, a more Christ-like life or more God-like life. That's another way of saying you're going to turn your life around. Now, we all know from our experience that baptism didn't totally change us. It's when I got baptized, Tony Hammer said, he said, young man, um, actually he baptized me in the Army swimming pool at, anyway, Fort Sam Houston. He said, young man, with God's spirit just crowded out a little bit of your carnality. You got a long way to go, but you're on the right start. And uh, I believe he was right. But the, <clears throat> my only point is you commit to turning around. It may be an upward struggle, but you know, up and down, but you're going up. You're getting better. You're not saying, I'm using the justification of Christ as a license to sin all I want. I realize nobody takes it that way, but if, you, but if you didn't think it through, you could take it that way. And that's not the way Paul meant to, for people to take it. What he meant was, you can't save yourself. Or put it another way, I know I've used this bank robbing example because it's a good one. If you're running up and down the main street of your town, maybe it's Broadway, Highway 13, and you drive by all these four or five banks every day and you obey the law and don't rob the bank, that's wonderful. But if a couple of times you go to the bank and you got your little pistol or you, maybe you can even bluff the, uh, the clerk and say, I got a gun in my pocket and if you don't give me all the cash in your drawer, I'm going to start shooting. And you, she gives it to you and you, maybe you're wearing a, a mask for COVID purposes, so they don't recognize you in sunglasses, and you run out the door and you get away with it. 
Uh, they later find out who you are and they indict you for bank robbery. And you say, well, wait a minute. For many, many, many months, I've driven by those banks and obeyed the law. But they say, yes, but the two or three times you robbed the bank, that's the indictment. Your obeying the law does not erase that indictment. In other words, our past sins are not erased by us obeying the law. See, the Judaizing party, now they probably wouldn't admit it quite so bluntly, but they had a concept of earning salvation. They were super righteous, so God would be so overwhelmed with their righteousness. We tithe on every leaf in our garden. We skip four meals a week uh, fasting, or whatever, different ones did different things. There's one that even wore a net over their face when they went in the marketplace, so no bug could ever get in their mouth, nothing unclean ever entered their mouth. God is so impressed with me. So that you see that, that attitude of, I'm, God is so impressed with my goodness that God's got to put me in his kingdom. I'm going to be one of his top men. Um, can you see why God doesn't like that attitude? You cannot earn your salvation. And I'm not saying don't be good, but if you're being good in a self-righteous way, like, you know, I'm really being good because I'm good, uh, that's what Paul was fighting when he said, um, you can't not be justified you can't erase your indictment by your own efforts. And yet, we have to be careful of self-righteousness, too. I believe that's one of Satan's sins. And it's even hard to picture it, but I really believe Satan often uses even religion for evil. He gets them in a self-righteous attitude. You, you know, anyway, I believe that's part of some religious persecution in the past. This, one, this joke is called Missing Husband. It kind of makes a point. <laughs> Missing husband. Um, Ray was in big trouble. He forgot his wedding anniversary. And his wife was mad. And she was the type that when she got mad, she was really mad. And she says, well, the day's not over. By morning time, there better be in the driveway something that'll go from zero to 130 in 60 seconds. You know, you've seen these things where <clears throat> for the big gift day of Christmas, there's a car in the driveway with a big bow on the top. By the way, that's going to be harder to do in today's world now, getting new cars like that. But anyway, but that's what she wanted. Uh, <laughs> he couldn't quite do that. But when it got up in the morning, there was a big box, well, well wrapped, nice bow on the top, sitting in the driveway. So she went out driving, picked up the box. This better be something really nice. She unraveled it, and in the box was a scale. Well, it actually could go from zero to 206 seconds. <laughs> and Ray's been missing for several days since then. <laughs> uh, like one guy said, for our anniversary, I gave my wife a vacuum cleaner. Oh, was that a smart thing to do? <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Oh, I love the Garfield cartoon where Garfield walks up to the scale. He's got a revolver in his hand. He says, okay, scale, now see what you got to say. Like, <laughs> it's one of those talking scales. <laughs> and Garfield's got the big tummy. And, you know, it's, it's funny if you look at it from Garfield's point of view. <clears throat> Matthew 23, 3 to 5. I want to go back to the, the way Judaism had evolved. In, in the days of, this is Christ speaking, but it was even true a few years later when Paul wrote his letter, Matthew 23, 3 to 5. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. In other words, Christ is saying the leadership of Judaism is burdening the people, like a heavy burden on their, in other words, they made religion burdensome. That's what the Judaizing party wanted to do. They want Christianity had the energy and the fire and the growth. And they wanted to pull Christianity back into the fold. There are many sects of Judaism. It wasn't so much they hated this sect. They did hate it, but uh, they could tolerate it as long as it seemed to stay in the fold. But if you start accepting uncircumcised Gentiles, 
eh, you see. And it wasn't just circumcision either. When you read Paul, Paul implies that if you accept circumcision, what will go with it is the whole spirit of earning your own salvation, the spirit of self-righteousness. God owes it to me because I obey the law so wonderfully. And they would fall into the burdensome of Judaism. And, and really, when he was talking to Peter, the Christians had avoided that the burden of Judaism. I'm not saying they were against God's law, they were keeping it, but they were keeping it in a free, balanced, personal religious freedom. For instance, um, our church doesn't go around telling people how to keep the Sabbath. We just tell you to keep the Sabbath. Of course, you don't uh, go out and do your regular job for eight hours every Sabbath, of course. But, but, but of course, the Jews had 600, over 620 rules enforcing Sabbath keeping. Even if you read some of those rules, you can see how restrictive it was. I mean, all kinds of petty stuff. I'm told the ones that, I, I got this from reading the website, Hasidic Jews in New York, and, and they were another place, they're in St. Louis too, by the way. They're, they live around where my Natalie's uncle used to live. Um, the women's dresses all dragged the ground, which is their business, I'm not putting it down, but they had a rule that if somebody got sick, um, and you want, because the ambulance could be slow, you want to drive them to the hospital, um, you had to leave your car at the hospital if it was on the Sabbath day. You couldn't use your car until after sunset. I mean, you had to walk home or, I don't know, get another ride. And, and other related rules to taking people to the hospital on the Sabbath. I'm, I'm thinking, some of it seemed so arbitrary. Now, if I misquoted it, but it's something like that, my reading of it. Uh, elevator buttons, I might have mentioned this before, because I actually experienced it in Miami. Uh, they had a Sabbath switch, and the, it was 18 floors, and the, it, you had to go through every floor, so nobody had to push the elevator button, because pushing the button violated their fire law on the Sabbath. I'll explain it later, in case you don't. And the, you realize what a burden that is. If you're on the like 17th floor, you got to go elevator close, elevator up, next floor, all the way down. Where if you push the button, you get down right away or up right away. Uh, they had stoves where on the Sabbath you had to pre-program it, or if you had a Bunsen burner, you wanted to use it on the Sabbath. You had to turn it on Friday before sunset and leave it on all day. Potential fire hazard, by the way. I'm just giving you a few examples of it. Christ criticized him. He said the Sabbath was made for man, for our benefit, not for man to serve the Sabbath. So the Judaizers wanted to bring them back into Judaism's regulated laws. And it wasn't so much that circumcision was all that bad. I think Paul recognized the spirit behind it. But also, because of ethnic religious bias, probably we could look at some Greeks and others, people in the Middle East, and Jews, and we couldn't tell the difference between them, probably. But see, ethnic bias doesn't have to be based on easy to recognize differences. Like, you know, the, the Koreans and the Japanese don't like each other, the Chinese and Japanese don't like each other, and I bet you couldn't tell the difference between them. Maybe you could, but probably not. And there's some African tribes that don't like each other. Now, now I talked to one lady from, I forgot, which tribe. She can tell, but we probably couldn't. My point is, ethnic bias can be, and hatred can be a very tricky thing. You can't easily see it, but it does, it's a very powerful force. And they wanted to use circumcision to limit the number of Gentiles coming into the church. How would you like it if you, you heard somebody preaching, oh, I agree, let's leave paganism. Then you go to church and they say, well, you can't really be a full member of this church <coughs> until you have a certain operation. What? You're kidding me. You can imagine. I think I'll stay uh, <laughs> with the Temple of Baal or some other pig. But you see how that would work, right? They didn't mind that. They wanted to put that limit there. Um, and salvation is a gift. God wants us to appreciate it. And Paul was saying, you can't earn it. I'm not saying he wants you to be sinful, but you just can't earn your salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. But as fellow workmen, we also beseech 
that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, I've listened to you in an accepted time. I've helped you in a day of salvation. Behold, now is a well-accepted time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. For us, now is a day of salvation. Don't let somebody trick you into using grace in vain. In other words, if you say, I got grace so I don't have to obey God in any area I don't want to obey God in, you know, you pick and choose which laws you want to keep. That would be taking grace in vain, and God is not going to accept it. Um, 2 Corinthians 2, 6 to 8. 2 Corinthians 2, 6, 18. 2, 6, 18. 2, 6, 18 says, I'll be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. And then I'm going on, this, the same thought. The chapter breaks are arbitrary. Same thought, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2. Therefore, having these promises... Now that you're going to be sons of God. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That mud puddle example. In other words, because we're going to be sons and daughters of God, Paul is saying, let's cleanse ourselves. That's a way of saying get rid of sin. And I wasn't, I, I could read James 2 where he says, faith is vain if you don't do anything. But you got to do something. You know, he says, show me your faith by your actions. So God expects us to do things. Whatever you think the right thing is, do it. Now, before I end this sermon, I want to just talk for a brief moment or two about the principle behind the law of God that we're supposed to keep. And you know from the Bible study we're doing in 1 John, 1 John keeps mentioning love. That that's one of the key signs that you're a son of God. One of the things that Christ predicted would happen as we approach the end time, he said, love would grow cold. And I hear of weird crimes where parents are killing their own children in weird ways. I heard one this week. You probably don't want to hear about these gruesome things and... Um, You know the the marriage rate is down. Um, I, more people. I just feel love is dying in America and in the Western world, maybe in a, a lot of the world. I'm not even sure if I can explain it, put my finger on it, but I can sense it. Can't you sense it? Love is dying. And, and you look at a lot of the Twitter mob. Somebody says something they don't agree with, get them. I don't mean we want to criticize them and try to straighten them out or say they're wrong. No, get them. Destroy their career. Destroy their life. Humiliate them. I think they're after Aaron Rodgers now. Uh, he'll probably survive it. Um, if you're famous and rich enough, you may survive it. But for a lot of people, you know, it's like in this, that hatred is out there. You sense it. You see it in the media more. I don't mean they just want to criticize or disagree with people they disagree with. No, they want to destroy them. Destroy them. Destroy them. You read about things going on in Washington, D.C. Wow. This is a level of malevolent evil that you might have expected the fascists to do. All I'm saying is hatred and lack of love is growing. You can sense it and feel it. People don't know their neighbors, not like they used to. And I, I was talking to my younger son about some stuff. And, and I was saying, I said, um, when I was young, I'm not saying the world was perfect. There were problems, and you know, we all admit that. But people knew their neighbors more. There was less violence. You didn't have powerful drug gangs running around cities. I mean, there was some of it, but it wasn't that big. And people were just kinder and gentler. Black community, white community. I'm giving my opinion of stuff I saw when I was growing up. And um, I could give some personal examples, but I don't want to do that right now. The only point I'm saying is 
I believe if you could have gone back to the 50s, 60s, and maybe early 70s, you would have found a kinder, gentler America, more love. But now, there's people are cold and angry and hateful, the slightest offense, and they turn on you, and you're out of it. So I want to talk about love. Now I'm going to a, a translation called the Message Bible, where the writer puts love into the common language. And I just want to quote what he said, because he put it in common language in really sharp tones that stand out. You know, you know, Paul starts off in 1 Corinthians 13. He tells you what love is. You know, love, great knowledge, even Bible knowledge, is not love. Great preaching is not love. Great miracle doing is not love. Uh, it's almost like the jangling of noise. Even great charitable sacrifices, that's not really love. Now, if you do it out of love, it's love, but it's not love in itself. Then he tells you what love is. Now, I'm going to read the message translation of love because it's almost like poetry. It's so beautiful. Okay. Love never gives up. You know, some people, the pressure gets on them. They roll over and compromise. But love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. You know, that, if anything is the opposite of human nature, isn't that the opposite of human nature? Often you can tell what people, why they're doing what they're doing when you look at their self-interest. Hope I don't get canceled for this statement, but if someone were to ask me, well, the drug companies are now saying you have to get boosters every year, maybe in some cases more than every, every eight or nine months. And of course, they get money every time that's done. Is their self-interest in any way biasing what they're saying? Is this a thought? Yes, a thought. I'm not. I'm not telling you not to get boosters if you want to. I'm just saying, you see things going on and you wonder: Is there any self-interest, any uh, extra motivation? Self-interest is behind a lot of what goes on. You know, they say. Um, Bribe affects people's thinking. I used to tell students, if you accept any bribe from any vendor, your judgment in that business deal is forever compromised. Lots of people say, oh, I can take a bribe and it wouldn't affect my judgment. Yes, it will. Take my word for it, it will. Um, love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Boy, wouldn't that be wonderful. But isn't even a lot of what you see on TV pushing you to want stuff that maybe you can't afford or don't need. By the way, it appears that people are pulling in their horns as far as shopping goes. And this could, we could be facing a recession. I'm not predicting it because there are a lot of factors that we are, inflation's here for sure. That, there's no doubt about that. But, um, but they don't want people to pull in their horns. They want you to buy, shop, buy, buy, more, more. And, um, and I, as a kid, I was really bad in this way. A lot of people had stuff I didn't have, and I was envious, and I already told you that. But, but you know, the funny thing is, as you get older and more mature, at some point it dawns on you, so what if they have something that you don't have? It doesn't guarantee they're happy. It really doesn't. And if you were to get more than you have now, it wouldn't guarantee you'd be happy. Happiness is beyond just, well, look at what he's got. And uh, the guy across the street has a boat and a camper. I'm not, because he's young enough to do all that camping and boating. And, uh, and he, actually, he got the house from his parents. I mean, he's, he had a lot of breaks. And I, I knew his grandfather, and I'm happy that he got his grandfather's house. But am I jealous that he has a boat and a camper? I could care less. He said, yeah, that's because you don't want it. But if I did, but you get my point. Whatever they've got that you don't have, don't worry about it. Obviously, get what you think you want and need if you, if you can afford it. But I, I would tell people, with the financial things that could go wrong in the world in the next year or so, like the biggest, one of the biggest companies in China is already um, refusing to pay interest to their creditors. I won't go into details because probably we could care less about the details. 
It could start a crescendo of events that could lead the world into bad trouble, depending on how everybody takes it. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe not. But the point is, this might be a time not to get into big debt buying more and more stuff and getting the media to want you to take more and more stuff. The stuff will not make you happy. It will not make you happy. Matter of fact, the more stuff you have, the more stuff you got to be worried about taking care of, right? And if you have a big, huge house, oh, what a big, huge house. Uh, and that's a nice thing to have. But as heating costs go up this winter, they're saying 45% or more. That's all that much more you got to heat more money to clean and take care of it, is it really worth it? Well, you know, obviously if you need the space, oh, that's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> here's another one. Love doesn't strut. You don't show off, do stuff. You don't want to buy stuff and get stuff just to show off. Love doesn't have a swelled head. And vanity is a problem. It's a problem for everybody. Somebody compliments you a couple times, or they tell you how charming you are, whatever it is, and it goes to your head, right? Um, we got to, by the way, um, you know, any gift that you have, you don't have it because of innate greatness on your part. It's because God gave it to you. It looks like most talents, I mean, obviously you improve it by skill and practice and training and all that, but most gifts people have, we think, are genetic. You're born with it. It was given to you as a gift, right? So if it's a gift and you were born with it, don't get the big head like it's, you know, something special. Um, love doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first. That really sounds like selfish. Me first. Love doesn't fly off the handle. Do you know you can get mad just like that. Somebody says something, does something, you get, and I think we all have to work at this. When that urge hits you, they made me mad. And, and it could be the people closest to you, like your spouse or your brother-in-law or your brother or anyway, whoever it is. And they say something, do something, I am mad. And before you know it, you pop off and give them what's for. Um, when that urge hits us, we need to pull ourselves back. Remember, love doesn't fly off the handle. You're under control. Even if you want to disagree with them or tell them they're wrong, you do it in a controlled, calm, loving way uh, if you feel it's necessary. Sometimes, it's you know, telling a fool he's wrong is a fool's errand. You know what I mean, don't you? I think you do. Just leave him alone and move along. Um, Love doesn't keep score of the sins of others. You know, you're not dancing on other people's grave. Yeah, I knew he'd get it. I'm so happy he got it. Um, you know, I've been keeping score of all his bad stuff and the times he's let me down. I got to, oh, he's let me down at least four times. We shouldn't be doing that. Um, love doesn't revel when others grovel. Love <coughs> takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. We love truth. The more truth, the better. We love truth. Love puts up with anything. Wow. Puts up with anything. That means you have to put up with the, the chatter of things you don't like and people who have weaknesses and problems and uh, we're not put around perfect people. And you just got to learn to put up with it. But isn't that what the bigger man does? Um, I don't know if you remember this, but Andy Griffith in his TV show, at least he seemed bigger than a lot of people in Mayberry because he put up with a lot of stuff. He just didn't let it get to him. I, I thought that was good, unless I misinterpreted the show. But love, trust God always. You know, trusting God always. And, and the tough part is, and, and there's even a whole section of theology where they discuss this, when things go wrong, can you still trust God? Because you're going to say, well, why did God let something evil happen? And by the way, no one can fully answer that question. Maybe someday we get in God's family. In 19, 
2021 20, August, whatever it was, you let this bad thing happen to me. Why? Maybe God will give you an answer. So we don't have all the answers. We can speculate. But that's when the big test comes. Can you trust God even when something bad happens? Well, I prayed about it, and I didn't get the answer I wanted. Or um, why did he let bad Bob do whatever he's done, or he got the advantage on the job, and I didn't get the promotion because he lied about me. Why didn't God stop him? You know, some there are questions, or why did my Aunt Mabel die? Uh, actually, this is probably sad to say, but it does appear everybody has an expiration date. Now, I think keeping ourselves healthy and eating right, you can maybe extend that some. But how much you can extend it, I don't know. In other words, in spite of our prayers and our wishes, people that we know and love will pass away. And you can be mad at God, and uh, I'm not going to trust God. He let so-and-so die. It, it, you, know, you could argue the other side of it. If God healed everybody every time, people would never die, and apparently that's not God's will. And I, you know, I'm not saying that as a nice thing. That's just true. You have to trust God no matter what. Uh, <clears throat> trust God always. Love always looks for the best. You have a positive approach to people and life. And I know Carl Hill was talking about the bad things going on now. He said maybe this is good for America if we learn lessons from it. And maybe we won't even fully see the lesson until a future resurrection or much later. But sometimes, because I can see people saying to God, well, God, we had this great um, version of socialism, humanism, but we didn't need God, and the government was going to take care of everything, and we'd create, uh, as a matter of fact, all the communist, socialist, fascist governments have all talked about a government-created utopia. And there's a whole literature and stuff called Utopia. And every one of the utopias ended up in suppression and violence. And, well, they got the bad stuff, but they didn't get the good stuff. And, and you can check that. Um, not just Mussolini and Hitler and Stalin, but uh, you can look at what happened in Cuba, Venezuela, Paul Pot. I can rattle off other names. They have books about it. it but they said, but we had, a, but the Americans can do it right. And God could say, okay, I let you all try a bunch of that stuff in America. And then here's what happened. So in other words, maybe God is, you're going to say, but that seems like a hard way to learn, hard way. But it could be in some way God realizes learning the hard way is the best way. I'm just, you know, talking about what, Carl and I were discussing, but it could be true. Because you're going to say, well, why does God let some of these weird things happen in America of all places? Well, maybe God wants us to learn the hard way. So don't get too depressed. God is still in control, and it will eventually, I say this, I don't know when the eventual will happen, but it will eventually work for good. All things work for good. By the way, that scripture says all things work for good. There's a clause on the end of that. It says, for those who love God. See, that's the tricky part. You say, well, if all things work for good, I don't see it. Well, do you really love God as well as you're supposed to? See, the first four commandments and expand it is how to love God. But also when you use the bottom six to love man, that also makes is a way of loving God because you love your fellow man. So maybe if we learn to love God more, we'll get more prayers answered. <clears throat> but anyway, that's the thing to think about. Um, love never looks back. You know, I'm looking back with regret. You're always stewing over the bad things of the past. Um, I think it's bad to look at your life and say, I could have had a better childhood. How come I wasn't born into upper middle class family? Or how come... Uh, my dad had a drinking problem, or whatever bad thing you want to think about. Or I had a mean, older brother who kept beating me up, and he got away with it. And whatever, everybody probably has something in their past that you can complain about. Well, love never looks back like, if only I could have had, yes, that's true. 
Um, we have to make the best of life. If only I could have uh, bought some McDonald's stock like somebody told me and uh, or whatever. Elon Musk stock a couple years ago, I'd be rich. Why didn't God, you know, you can talk about people gave you bad advice. If only I hadn't bought that losing property, you know, everybody's got regrets. Just live with it. Don't worry. Don't spend your time fretting over spilled milk. Uh, or if only I had married so-and-so, you know, whatever you think would make your life a paradise. The things that people always fuss about. Um, love keeps on going to the end. That means we have to stay with God until the end. And all this is out of 1 Corinthians 13, just a different translation. And self-righteous attempts of, at saving ourselves, and that's what the circumcision party wanted, are wrong. We need to be humble and push to be more like Jesus, follow the path of love, and remember, God is love.